In recent years, dating apps have been working to overcome an unfortunate limitation of their business model, which is that people tend to use their apps for dating. This, clearly, is a problem. Most dating apps are marketed towards long-term monogamy. They're used for other purposes — friendships, hookups, drug deals — but most of them at least market themselves as tools to find your soulmate. But once you've found your soulmate, you delete the app the product is rendered obsolete. The dating app Hinge celebrates this fact, advertising itself as the dating app designed to be deleted. Many of the other apps, though, are not so enthused. Today's tech companies are obsessed with time spent on app. TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube compete to extract as much time from you as possible. Dating apps would love to do the same. The longer you spend on the app, the more time you spend looking at ads, the more likely you are to purchase paid features, the more profit is generated. The apps can attempt a variety of strategies to fix their central flaw. One strategy is to simply keep you single, make their matching algorithms a little worse. Just good enough for you to have some hope that using them will eventually pay off, but just bad enough that it never does. Another strategy is to keep you coming back to the app for something else. You've got Bumble BFF for friendship, Bumble Biz for networking, Tinder has been trying to transform into a more general-purpose social media app. Which brings us to a final strategy original content. Swipe Night Killer Weekend is a Tinder original choose-your-own-adventure slasher comedy web series fully integrated into the date swiping experience. I hate every word I just said. You're placed directly into the narrative, on your way to your friend Benji's 23rd birthday party as you receive text messages personalized to you based on the data provided on your Tinder profile. Teo, where are you at? Props fighting a stranger for stepping on your shoes again. Aries, so predictable. You don't fucking know me, Benji. Oh, hey, you made it. Thank God you're here. This party blows. Why are you people talking to me? Leave me alone! Get your ass up here! After Benji is tragically murdered, you have to find out who did it, making decisions about who to trust, whether to pick up a shovel or a cactus for self-defense, whose Instagram story to watch for clues. Crazy what people will post. Those decisions are then publicly displayed on your Tinder profile and used to optimize pairings for speed dating style matchups. Imagine telling your grandkids that that's how you and grandpa met. You're the one who was having an affair with my boyfriend. Affair? It's not an affair, it's a true love! Welcome to the future, where everything is content. Your dating profile sits seamlessly alongside branded entertainment. Keep swiping to unlock exclusive chats and character romance options. Join our subscription tier to access exciting new storylines with even more potential suitors. Your steamy hookups, your awkward first dates, and your fleeting love stories form just a small part of the broader dating app cinematic universe. When I heard that the gay hookup app Grindr had created an original series, I knew I had to download the app to watch the series and for no other reason. When I talk about dating apps in this video, you better not imagine that I'm speaking from experience. I am not one of you. I am a carefully packaged piece of content created for your consumption. I do not interfere in the affairs of mortal men. Episode one of the Grinder original series Bridesman introduces us to Terry. Oh. A self-absorbed gay guy who goes back to his hometown to attend the wedding of his childhood best friend, Judith. Uh, most of the characters in this show have old people names. I'm here just because there was like a really horrific accident. Oh my god, I'm so sorry. A funeral? A wedding! Terry is not happy about the impending marriage, as he repeatedly interrupts his Uber driver to explain. My childhood best friend is getting married and I am a bridesmaid. Oh, that seems... Sad. Yeah, I agree. Oh, no, I was actually going to say it sounds... Sad? Yeah, no, I'm actually... I'm agreeing with you. The Uber driver, by the way, is played by the same actor who played Benji's boyfriend in Swipe Night Killer Weekend. Benji's dead! He's cute, I like him. But anyway, as Terry makes very clear, he sees this wedding as a tragedy. It's like the patriarchy has said, this is what you do with your life, and everything leads to this, and Meghan Markle ruined England. As we quickly learn through a flashback, this skepticism isn't surprising. See, when Terry and Judith were growing up, their friendship largely consisted of rattling off queer theory hot takes to each other on the playground. Sexual position exclusivity is almost always self-restrictive. Yes. Like, bottoming has a mainstream cultural association of feminized labor playing into sexual hierarchies. Yeah, and it's just like that conversation we had about politics 
polyamory. These elementary schoolers know what's up. When we get older, I hope we don't get brainwashed by the heteropatriarchal constructs of relationships. Since the second grade, Terry and Judith have understood that the hegemonic interlocking oppressions of heteronormativity and patriarchy function as a biopolitical social control apparatus to subjugate the marginalized and maintain an imperialist white supremacist capitalist system. They saw their classmate Cheryl play acting a fantasy wedding, and they nipped that shit in the bud. Fuck you, marriage. And fuck you, Cheryl. As Judith and Terry are presumably aware, marriage did not originate as an institution of love. For most of human history, it's been a primarily political and economic system. It was used to establish alliances. Fathers gave their daughters as property in exchange for economic relationships and material benefits. It was used to maintain a division of labor in which the women do unpaid housework and child rearing so that men can spend their time mining Bitcoin. The idea that marriage is about love, about the natural joy and beauty of heterosexual monogamy, is a modern invention, mostly starting to take off in the 19th century. And as young Judith points out, this merging of marriage and love has been rife with contradiction. Bitch, is the 90s. 50% of marriages end in divorce anyway. Love and the force of law often aren't an easy match. Even as marriage in the US has expanded to include us gays, it remains an exclusionary institution. Its purpose as a legal system is to reward certain kinds of relationships and family structures over others. It regulates access to things like healthcare, immigration, and financial benefits, and by design, it leaves people out. In the US, many disabled people currently can't get married without losing access to essential health care and benefits. The demonization of unmarried black families has long been a tool of racism, and many of the legal benefits of marriage would be useful to people in all kinds of relationships outside of monogamous romance. Polyamorous people, non-romantic co-parents, long-term roommates, close friends, queer platonic situationships. These relationships and family structures are devalued not just through marriage, but by society as a whole, treated as less meaningful and less worthy of recognition because they threaten the normative organization of society, the way in which labor is distributed, typical patterns of household consumer spending. Terry and Judith understand all this. They're familiar with queer activist Dean Spade's writing on the subject. They've carefully annotated Stephanie Kuntz's landmark work, Marriage, A History. They've been reading Andrea Dworkin since they were three years old. Why can't society recognize relationships outside of marriage as fulfilling and meaningful? It's like, you know, what we have, for instance. I hope the world changes when we're older since we're just seven now. Yeah, we are seven right now. So Terry and Judith decided to be what they called forever partners. Cheers yeah. to forever partners. Forever partners. It wasn't sexual or romantic, but this bond would be the central bond of their lives. They committed themselves to a practice of queer world making, looking outside of traditional relationship models in order to build kinship and community on their own terms. Usually in my videos, I critique the media that I talk about. I analyze the ways in which that media reflects troubling cultural narratives. But it's harder to do that with a series where the main character is so extremely right. Yes, society should value a broader range of relationships. Yes, marriage is slavery. Yes, you should break up your best friend's wedding by seducing her fiance. I'll do the same when my time comes. Point is, I'm here and I'm gonna stop this wedding. And if I have to hook up with her incredibly hot fiance who I have insane sexual chemistry with, then I'll do it. For her. Yes, go off, king. I don't care if gays can do it. Weddings are homophobic. And that's the end of episode one. Credits roll, woo. Why did Grindr create this series? I wanna address this point before we move deeper into wedding drama. The main motivation is pretty obvious. It's branded content used for marketing. Grindr is an app for queer people and a series full of self-aware cynicism towards traditional straight fantasies plays great to dumbasses like me. When I say abolish marriage, I don't mean abolish marriage as a legal institution. I mean criminalize it all. Send those perverts to jail. There's plenty of potential 
potential to profit from people skeptical of normative relationship structures. In some ways, they're the ideal demographic for the dating app business model. Compared to other apps, Grindr has a whole lot less monogamy. It doesn't have the built-in obsolescence of an app designed to eventually find the one. If we understand the history of heteropatriarchy as closely intertwined with a capitalist social order, Grindr is one of many attempts to absorb queerness back into a market. Attempts to capitalize on queerness are of course widespread. Think of Pride Month pinkwashing, which everyone from Burger King to JP Morgan brags about how much they love the homosexuals. This kind of advertising isn't interested in queer well-being. It understands queerness as a consumer identity, a marketing demographic. Grindr has a motivation beyond advertising for producing this series, though. Making the world a better place. As their head of marketing explains, promoting visibility and representation can move the needle toward a more accepting world. And a more accepting world means more Grindr users. Why do we fight for a better future? In order to sell subscriptions to Grindr Ultimate. As useful as Grindr has been for many queer people in finding community and grinding. It's also a tech company that until recently was run by a bunch of straight Silicon Valley venture capitalists and is now run by a gay Republican openly supportive of anti-queer politicians. The vision of the future that the company promotes is based entirely on profit potential. It's queer world making gone corporate. What kind of queer world can produce the largest customer base? As queer rights increasingly come under attack, with the passage of anti-trans legislation, a rise in educational censorship, and the rolling back of protections for LGBT people, I guess we just have to hope that the profit potential in crafting a more accepting world is stronger than the profit potential in crafting a repressive one. Terry arrives at the wedding, where he and Judith are excited to reunite. You know what, it's not too late. Like, I can literally take you out of here and save you from this. <laughs> you are so funny! Terry is also introduced to the three wedding interns, Horace, Hugh, and Helen. Not their real names. It's their wedding names, you know, for them to mentally detach from their outside identities, dreams, children, hopes. Names are a notable motif in Bridesman. In this case, the decision not to use the interns' names serves to deprive them of their individual individual identities, setting this wedding against the backdrop of a cold, inhuman environment. When they're not staffing this wedding, the interns are actually investment banking interns for Judith's best friend in adulthood, Muriel. If I'm RuPaul and Judith is Michelle Visage, Muriel is fracking. I mean, I don't even know how she snaked her way into Maid of Honor. I see everything. Terry and Muriel can't stand each other. Their personalities are diametrically opposed. Terry is an anti-institution free spirit who refuses to be bound down by social responsibility. Muriel is a micromanaging financial elite attempting to tightly control the wedding so that everything goes according to plan. I got you a welcome gift. Wait, is... Is this a nanny cam? She sees Terry as a threat to this goal and stages an intervention as soon as he arrives. I know you're all like, I hate marriage. I hate monogamy. I hate anyone else in Judith's life, even if they're a fiance or the reliable best friend. It was Muriel's decision to rename her interns, and particularly given her position in a high-level finance career, the renaming serves as a clear expression of alienation under capitalism. While the wedding staff work, they are completely detached from their identities. Their humanity is taken from them, and they're reduced to cogs in the machine of the wedding industrial complex. I don't actually know my real name anymore. <laughs> I've dissociated. Notably, though, this kind of dehumanization isn't unique to Muriel. Terry is actually especially bad with names. This first comes up during his Uber drive to the wedding venue as he describes the wedding guests to his driver. Last and definitely least is Cindy. Oh wait, no, it's Cheryl. Sometimes you forget certain people have names like waiters and my biological dad. He has a persistent disregard for the personhood of those around him. Like that Uber driver who patiently listens to him as he talks about his feelings, but who he just constantly interrupts. And then Terry and the Uber driver hook up. Oh, that was fun. And Terry still gives him a three-star Uber rating. Five stars. Probably didn't tip either. In their playground discussions of social justice, Terry and Judith had understood their ideals as being about finding shared humanity. Their rejection of traditional romantic narratives wasn't a rejection of human connection, it was about expanding the kinds of connection viewed as meaningful. But now, as an adult, Terry's queerness is seemingly no longer a path to sincere connection. He's entirely self-absorbed, uninterested in any kind of solidarity. He 
blames Judith for abandoning their forever partnership by getting married, but he's the one who moved away. He's the one who hasn't been there for her. Muriel is the reliable best friend. I have dedicated my life to being Judith's best friend, and this weekend is about us. Not you. That's right, this weekend is about Judith and Muriel. Muriel is right to be suspicious of Terry. Terry's a menace. He's trying to have sex with the groom. Oh my god. Why had you like, expect to bump into you? He is willfully oblivious to every indication of Wyatt's disinterest, determined to go through with his destructive plan. Uh, oh my uh, whoops. <laughs> Whoops, indeed. Terry's character is essentially a self-aware anti-gay stereotype. He's a reckless homosexual with a fear of commitment, trying his best to be a homewrecker. Is the lesson gonna be that the queers need to get off grinder and get married? Because that would not be good advertising. Terry is a frequent grinder user, as you can see in this poorly edited shot of a grinder screen recording overlaid on his phone. And to me, his character feels not just like a gay stereotype, but specifically like a personification of some of the strongest critiques of Grindr itself. Seven-year-old Terry's dreams of queer world-making have given way to a disconnected individualism. This is exactly what critics of Grindr fear. Many people have implicated Grindr in the demise of queer public spaces, the decline of gay bars and gay gathering spots, the weakening of offline queer communities. I don't think any of this is actually primarily the fault of Grindr. It corresponds with broader cultural trends like the decline of urban public spaces, the rise of social media, increases in loneliness and isolation. Regardless, for many queer people, Grindr isn't a supplement to an offline community, but a replacement for one. In his analysis of Grindr's interface, Chase Ounceback draws attention to the ways that the app individualizes its users, arguing that it promotes self-centeredness by design. People are automatically sorted based on their geographical proximity to you, ranked from closest to furthest with each profile displaying the distance from your phone to theirs. You are literally at the center of your own personalized queer community. Instead of traveling to a designated spot, melting into a moment, and riding its spontaneity, people have access and controls to navigate these spaces as if they only exist for themselves. Because algorithmically, they do. You filter out the people you don't want to see, limiting your queer public space to only those who meet your specifications. In some cases, that filtering can be discriminatory with the prevalence of slogans like mask for mask, no femmes, no fats, no Asians. These attitudes predate Grindr. Racism and body shaming obviously aren't new. Objectification isn't new. But Ounceback argues that the design of Grindr encourages and rationalizes these practices of sorting and filtering. Like other dating apps, it turns intimacy into a consumer activity. Queer space is a market. You set up your profile like a product page detailing your features and your specs. You shop between people like interchangeable commodities. Terry's self-centered dehumanization of others is by no means inherent to queerness, or to non-monogamy, or to promiscuity. But his flaws feel like a reflection of a capitalist logic shared by Grindr, the expansion of capitalist alienation into our interpersonal relationships. It's time to dig up dirt on Terry. And if you find something juicy, one of you interns goes full time. It's not just Terry and the interns who are alienated at this wedding. Nearly every character is dealing with their own form of disconnection. There are two more bridesmaids left to introduce. First is Cheryl, who as you'll recall, Terry and Judith have known since elementary school. Fuck you, Cheryl. Yeah, fuck you, Cheryl. They think of her as generally boring and forgettable, a background character in their lives who never rises to the level of interest. She's so boring. Cheryl is also a secret agent who over the course of the wedding repeatedly fends off attackers and defuses a bomb all unbeknownst to the other wedding guests. Tell me who sent you, and I'll spare your life. It was. Never mind. I like surprises. While Cheryl is living in an action movie, the remaining bridesmaid Bobby is in a psychological horror. She's dealing with some Babadook-ass shit. 
She's a mom and her son Hunter is terrifying. Have you ever heard a rabbit scream? Hunter! Both of these background characters are struggling in lonely, isolating situations. For Cheryl, her line of work requires her to conceal an enormous aspect of her life from everyone. She constantly goes unappreciated. Terry and Judith see her as utterly uninteresting. For Bobby, motherhood is isolating. Nobody else is equipped to care for Hunter, and when she does ask for help, she doesn't get it. I just need one of you to watch Hunter. Nope. Cheryl and Bobby both carry their burdens alone. Their struggles go unheard by those around them. Every day they are faced with violence and anxiety, and no one will help. Against this, the search for connection feels all the more pressing. Up to this point, it seems like maybe the only people to have achieved unalienated connection are Judith and Wyatt, the two characters riding the relationship escalator, following the traditional path set out for them. There's comfort in tradition, in institutions like marriage that a establish clear rules for how we relate to each other, but this too comes with problems. As Terry jokerifies himself in his hotel room, driven to insanity by his proximity to matrimony, Judith begins to let on that she shares some of his reservations around marriage. She's getting ready for her bridal boudoir photo shoot. What is a bridal boudoir shoot anyway? And the photo shoot is bringing out some tensions she feels about the wedding. It's a photo shoot to flaunt off that sexy body yaddy yaddy before marriage and children ruin it, and then you're only left with the flabby, empty husk of a woman that you used to be. As I discussed earlier, and as Judith is well aware, for most of its history, heteropatriarchy wasn't about love. It was a system of political and economic control. In her book, The Tragedy of Heterosexuality, Jane Ward examines the contemporary construction of straight love through what she terms the misogyny paradox, the persistence of sexism and gender inequality alongside an expectation that men and women achieve true love and reciprocity. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus, men and women are different species incapable of ever truly understanding each other, but somehow they're still supposed to love each other? Straight culture seems to rely on a blind acceptance that women and men do not need to hold the other gender in high esteem as much as they need to need each other, and to learn how to compromise and suppress their disappointment in the service of this need. Judith and Wyatt's relationship avoids many of these pitfalls. For one thing, they're not straight. Wyatt is bisexual, Judith is also implied queer, they don't seem to buy into gender essential and even within their straight-presenting relationship, they transgress certain gender norms. Judith eats Wyatt's ass. <laughs> From what we see, the relationship seems healthy and reciprocal. But still, Judith struggles with the patriarchal narrative surrounding marriage, particularly with the cultural idea that a wife's love for her husband necessarily entails self-sacrifice. I don't know if I'm really doing this for him, or I'm trying to hold on to this old version of myself that I should have thrown away a long time ago. These anxieties are understandable given the persistence of gendered inequality. Even among progressive couples striving for egalitarianism, the division of labor is often still unequal. Women still tend to do a larger share of housework and childcare. So Judith is panicking. I need to, uh... Go take a massive shit! And she locks herself in the bathroom. Terry and Judith both spend a lot of time in bathrooms in this show. Excuse me, ladies. I'm actually going to take a massive shit. The lessons of queerness might be instructive here in thinking through Judith's anxieties. In the 1980s, Michel Foucault spoke about same-sex relationships as formless. While relationships between men and women have long been institutionalized, with specific expectations, traditions, and goalposts, gay relationships have less of a defined path to follow. This was even more the case back in the 80s. Foucault saw this as freeing, offering space for inventiveness. Two men face each other without terms or convenient words, with nothing to assure them about the meaning of the movement that carries them toward each other. They have to invent, from A to Z, a relationship that is still formless, which is friendship. That is to say, the sum of everything through which they can give each other pleasure. While same-sex relationships necessitate a level of inventiveness, surely Judith and Wyatt can do some queer inventing too. Maybe that's why, as the bridesmaids fail to provide comfort through the bathroom door, Judith asks for Terry, her forever partner, the person with whom she did once invent a friendship from something formless. Where the fuck is Terry? 
So Muriel decides to track Terry down. Grinder says he's 30 feet away. Using Grinder. This is the first direct mention of Grinder in the series, so I think it's worth unpacking. As we've seen, Muriel has been hiding cameras throughout the wedding venue as part of her dystopian management strategy. And in this scene, Grinder is functioning as part of her extensive surveillance apparatus. There are a few Grinder features that make Muriel's search for Terry possible. In the free version of the app, you can't hide your profile from the grid. Like, when you open Grinder to watch Bridesman, the app shows everyone that you're currently online, and there's no way to hide that without paying. By the time you've gotten to this point in the series, you've probably received a few messages. What's up? What are you looking for? Maybe a dick pic or two. By default, the app also shows other users your distance from them in miles or feet. That's the feature Muriel used to track Terry down. For years, this feature has been at the center of controversies surrounding Grindr. Muriel's strategy for tracking down Terry has also been used maliciously in order to identify people and publicly out them. This is particularly dangerous in countries where homosexuality is criminalized, like in Egypt, where the app has been used by police to hunt down and imprison queer people. Muriel's snooping highlights these kinds of privacy concerns. This is a weird thing to include in your advertisement. For years, Grindr sold swaths of data, including location data that tracked users' precise movements. A few years ago, the company came under fire for sharing data about users' sexual tastes and HIV statuses with third-party companies. Because of this bad press, the company has cut down on some of the specific data they make available to third parties. But these aren't isolated scandals. User data is central in how Grindr makes money. Like most major platforms, they collect extensive data about how you use the app in order to refine the product and show you personalized advertisements. Ounceback describes this process as fundamentally extractive. Grinder facilitates queer experience and connection in order to extract data from it. It extracts queer social production for profit. The longer people spend on the app, the more of their activity it's able to extract. And of the dating apps, Grinder is the one users spend by far the most time on, around three times more per week than the average Tinder user. It's also the number one top ranked iPhone app and percentage of users who report that they were made unhappy by using it. In contrast to queer world making, Ounceback terms Grindr's form of extractive capitalism queer world taking, the colonization of queer life as the raw material for profit. Anyway, Terry saves the photo shoot by giving Judith benzos. You might want to get her water. These are gonna look really good. Yes, yes. Okay, hey, lower back. Oh. That's so pretty. And then Judith asks him to take over the planning for her bachelorette party. Yeah, but I, I'm the maid of honor. And he's the bridesman. <laughs> Judith and the bridesmaids show up to the bachelorette party that Terry threw together last minute. Welcome, ladies, to the unsinkable party! The party is Titanic-themed, so you sort of know disaster's coming. Already jealous that Terry was given party planning duties, Muriel grows increasingly resentful as she sees the party going well, with karaoke, a game of, uh, pin the dick on Leonardo DiCaprio, and a live Kim Petras performance that conveniently occurs off screen. Wow. God, I can't believe Kim Petras was here in person. As Muriel's resentment builds and she and Terry bicker relentlessly, she's informed by her interns that they have surveillance footage of Terry kissing Wyatt. And in a moment of shame after accidentally knocking over an ice luge, Muriel lets this slip. What? Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. You! You slept with my fiance! Judith is furious at the revelation that Terry and Wyatt hooked up. Which, I mean, they didn't, and Wyatt didn't even realize Terry had kissed him, but she doesn't know the details here. You were supposed to be my best friend! Yes, and as your forever partner, I promise you that I'd always have your back. And in this scenario, it's to remind you that marriage is a sham. You don't need a husband because we have each other. In Judith's rage, all of her anxieties and insecurities about marriage rise to the surface. She regurgitates a version of her childhood queer theory, now twisted into something entirely opposed to any notion of connection. You knew not to trust anyone. Monogamy is a lie! No one should be in a marriage. No one should be in a relationship. No one should be gay. No one should be straight. Everyone should be in a poly and sexual, bisexual, I forget now. In this climactic turning point, Terry and Judith both fully give in to their antisocial tendencies. And they both justify it by invoking some version of queer politics. No one should be straight. Marriage is a sham. While these rejections of connection seem far from liberating, based around insecurity, jealousy, and a fear of being hurt, I will remind you that this is all good, actually. Fuck you, marriage. 
Terry pulled it off. He saved the day. The scourge of marriage has been vanquished. In the early days of queer theory, as Terry and Judith were reading Foucault on the playground, Leo Bersani criticized the kind of queer utopianism they were so fond of. Bersani didn't buy the romanticized imagining of gay spaces as sites of inclusive, compassionate community. Often, they are not. Anyone who has ever spent one night in a gay bathhouse knows that it is, or was, one of the most ruthlessly ranked hierarchies and competitive environments imaginable. Your looks, muscles, hair distribution, size of cock, and shape of ass determined exactly how happy you were going to be during those few hours, and rejection, generally accompanied by two or three words at most, could be swift and brutal, with none of the civilizing hypocrisies with which we get rid of undesirables in the outside world. He wrote that in 1987. Maybe the dynamics of Grindr aren't so new. For Bersani, the liberating potential of queerness lies not in the ways it allows us to relate to each other, but instead in a complete rejection of the social order. Queer people refuse to fit in. They challenge restrictive systems of social control. The power of queerness lies in its ability to be anti-social and anti-communal. Bersani casts doubt on the prospect of building a new, more accepting social order. He's skeptical of the very foundations of our social fabric, of the basic ways that we relate to each other. To him, there's a violence in our efforts at knowing other people. Knowledge is inseparable from control from possession. Muriel's knowledge extraction, her collection of data on every aspect of the wedding, is rooted in a desire for complete control, a need to vanquish unpredictability. Bersani argues that our attempts to know each other work the same. Judith wanted full knowledge of Wyatt in order to render him predictable to her, in order to maintain a semblance of control, in order to eliminate the possibility of surprise or betrayal. You knew not to trust anyone. We want to know others to eliminate the possibility of being hurt by them, but that desire at its core is a desire to eliminate their otherness. If the only way we can build community is by knowing others, by relating to them, by containing them to our own boxes of understanding, then what do we do when we can't understand, when we don't relate, when other people are too different for us to really know them? What do we do with the conflict between Terry and Muriel, two people who approach the world in such different ways that they can't really make sense of each other? What do we do with Cheryl, who refuses to be known? Is there any hope for this bridal party of people who don't know each other and won't? The next morning, the bridesmaids are all worried, anxiously waiting to see Judith. Cheryl's so concerned that when she gets a text from the president informing her of a national emergency, she blows it off to deal with wedding drama. Text stop to unsubscribe. Terry, on the other hand, is refusing to internalize the emotional consequences of what happened. Even after Wyatt comes down to inform everyone that the wedding is off, Terry still acts like he doesn't give a shit. Do you guys want to go in the pool? Is it weird now? No one wants to use the pool! Muriel pleads with him to try to fix things, but he secludes himself in the bathroom. And then we arrive at this. Can you just come out here? I know you're just sitting on Grinder. <laughs> what can I say, Muriel? The Grinder app is a hotspot of cultural activity. Not only is it a great way to meet friends, it also excels as an effective networking device as well. With the Grinder app, truly sky's the limit. Okay, this is basically the same kind of self-aware meta-joke common in branded content. It's the same energy as when a brand account jokes about the fact that it's a brand account, or when a YouTuber jokes about selling out right before their sponsorship. I want to take a moment to thank my sponsor for this video, amazing LGBT allies who have been so supportive in my journey to embracing my loud, proud, sassy self, uh, Chevron. Despite Terry's inauthentically positive grinder ad read, the function that the app is serving for these characters in this moment is pretty dark. It's providing a means of detachment, serving as a barrier to Terry's willingness to care or to help. When Terry didn't show up to support Judith for her photo shoot, he was on Grinder. When he refuses to step up in this moment of crisis, again he's on Grinder. Whenever Grinder is featured, it's not a tool for connection, it's a hindrance to Terry's ability to connect. He's using it as shallow social stimulation at a moment when his most meaningful relationship is in jeopardy. 
Why is this grinder ad like this? Grinder's marketing often invokes this kind of negativity. Like if you look at their official TikTok, a fair amount of the videos are tongue in cheek depictions of unpleasant interactions facilitated through the app. <laughs> Maybe this is Grindr embracing queer antisociality, challenging a restrictive society by refusing social niceties and reclaiming obtrusive behavior. I suggested earlier that Grindr alienates our social relations by filtering them through market logic. Maybe that's good, actually. If our social relations inevitably lead to control and conformity, maybe they ought to be alienated. If the power of queerness lies in its ability to be antisocial, what's more antisocial than capitalist profit extraction? What's more antisocial than the reduction of people to commodities? Queer theorist Greg Goldberg draws on Bersani's celebration of the antisocial to make precisely this argument. Grinder's marketization of what might otherwise be properly social relations may be its most politically useful accomplishment. Far from imposing a limitation on sexual relations, the market is the means through which the social, with its evaluative and regulative norms and ethics, may be successfully thwarted. By interacting with others as commodities, we abstain from oppressing them through compassion or care. Hyper-individualism and atomization can liberate us. They can free us from the violence of relating to other people. I read too much queer theory and now I'm an anarcho-capitalist. Look, I'm not ready to give up on relating to others. I'm not ready to give up on community and care. While I find the antisocial understanding of queerness useful in challenging society as it is, I'm not ready to abandon our utopian longings for something better. Bersani doesn't entirely give up on social relations either. He wants to find new ways of relating ways of being together without the need for control. For Terry, it is ultimately a gay hookup that starts to show him a path forward. After leaving the wedding venue, Terry books another ride with the hot Uber driver. Are you okay? Up to this point, he's been suppressing his feelings about what happened with Judith and Wyatt. Yeah, sorry, it's just like, with all the crazy drama of the wedding, it's all like, how's the bride? How's the groom? How's the maid of honor? How are the bridesmaids? You almost forget like, how is Terry? But the driver prompts him to confront those feelings head on. Well, how is Terry? Terry feel... <laughs> Terry feel... Terry is not very good at confronting feelings head on. Car. <laughs> Trees. <laughs> Even as Terry remains frustratingly self-centered as ever, he and the Uber driver have chemistry. They like each other, they like being around each other, and having sex with each other. And in their brief interaction, the Uber driver helps Terry be a better person. The scene culminates with Terry realizing he needs to try to fix things with Judith and Wyatt. I finally understand true love. But what's odd about the scene is that Terry never opens up. The intimacy between him and the driver isn't based in them knowing each other. Terry, completely lacking in self-knowledge, fails to be known. <sighs> and he fails to take the opportunity to know another. It's been a really tough week. See, my mom's been really sick and yeah, she's me been too. in the hospital. It's been like a super tough week for me too, so. It's in the midst of this refusal to be known and refusal to know others that his revelations arrive. I got one more stop. I think this makes some sense. As much as Terry's an asshole in this scene, there's a spark of a lesson here. These two people are able to connect despite their lack of understanding. They enjoy being together even with the frustrations of not really knowing each other. Terry's biggest interpersonal failings throughout the series weren't actually a result of his disinterest in others, they were a result of him claiming to know them. He claimed to know what Wyatt really wanted, despite all evidence to the contrary. He claimed to know Judith better than she knew herself. In his mind, she was having false consciousness and deciding to get married, but he knew what she really needed. Terry comes around to the wedding, not because he understands Judith any better, but because he accepts that there are parts of her he doesn't understand. He doesn't get full access to Judith and Wyatt's relationship. He doesn't understand the appeal of their boring married monogamy, but he's ready to let go of control. Terry's not at the center of this wedding. Other people aren't algorithmically personalized to him. He finds Judith at the playground where they used to hang out as she tries unconvincingly to reenact their childhood dynamic. Love is a facade. 
It's a mask that the devil tricks you to wear to make you believe that happiness exists. I don't think that we ever said that. Terry and Judith are still forever partners, but Terry now treats that partnership not as restrictive, but as expansive, able to accommodate change, incomprehension, and surprise. He convinces her to give Wyatt another shot. We will always be each other's forever partners, you know? We will. And it's just that you have another forever partner that you deserve to be with. Okay, but it's, it's not exclusive. Both at the same time, so don't get it twisted. I don't want to suddenly have you stop picking up my phone calls. So, physically I'm with him, but, but emotionally, emotionally we're, we're poly. poly. You get it. Oh my god. You've seen enough TV. <laughs> Bridesman ends at the rehearsal dinner, in a scene that encapsulates many of the tensions of this series. At one level, it's very conventional. The wedding is back on, heteropatriarchy has triumphed, Terry gives an inspiring speech about the power of love. Love is... Important? He says a few words about each bridesmaid individually, sharing the lessons that he learned from them. Muriel, you taught me that when I have drama with someone in a wheelchair, that makes me kind of inclusive. He has not learned much, but they're there together in each other's company. The wedding has brought them all closer. To love. And then, with Terry now finally willing to celebrate the wonder of marriage, the Uber driver shows up. Oh my god, Uber driver, you made it. <laughs> You, you know my name is an Uber driver, right? <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> Terry is still self-centered, still failing to recognize the full humanity of his Uber driver slash partner, but he's improving, he's trying, and he's inspired by Judith and Wyatt to make a romantic declaration. I don't want to order another Uber unless it's you picking me up, or driving me around, or dropping me off. Even though Terry is still non-monogamous, I'm still a disgusting whore. It's striking to me that this story beat is essentially that of a monogamous romance. The way in which he expresses care is through exclusivity. Uber driver exclusivity. His character development has transformed him from a stereotype of a self-centered promiscuous gay guy into someone who's now ready for an exclusive commitment. It just feels to me like Terry's gonna be using Grindr a little less moving forward, which again seems like a weird character arc for this Grindr ad. My first reaction after watching this final scene was that its ultimate lessons feel surprisingly traditional. Terry and Judith's queer transgressions were little more than youthful naivete. The narrative trajectory of the series is that Terry needs to learn to accept his friend's heteronormative lifestyle, and in the process he learns some valuable lessons about what love should look like. But then as the credits roll, Terry and the Uber driver start seriously going at it, and then Judith and Wyatt start making out too and invite Cheryl to join in. It feels like the start of a whole rehearsal dinner orgy situation. So I mean, it's not all that traditional. Bridesman is set against a backdrop of tradition. It's a wedding story. But it's it takes that institution and desecrates it, finding moments of freedom within it. This show is branded content. It's functionally an advertisement for a tech company. It was greenlit entirely for profit, but you can tell there was love put into it. It wouldn't be an effective product if there weren't. Grinder wouldn't work if there wasn't some real connection to extract. As our every moment is transformed into a market commodity, there are still spaces of sincere care, glimmers of a potential better future lying in wait. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video, you might also enjoy my video about the dating show F Boy Island, which discusses some similar themes in a decidedly more heterosexual context.